An economy is not a complicated thing. It just has a lot of moving parts. But the basic is there's a transaction. And that transaction means somebody makes a purchase. They make a purchase of a good, a service, or a financial assets. That purchase can be made with money or credit. If money, when you make a purchase with money, you end the transaction. You don't owe anything. When you make it with credit, then there's a liability. You have to come up with the money because a credit, that debt, is an obligation to deliver money. So there's a basic transaction. There's spending, in other words, the total amount of money and credit spent on a good or service. And then there's the item that you're buying, a stock, a bond, a car, a bushel of wheat. There's that transaction. Demand is best measured in terms of spending. You know, I think in traditional economics, it's a mistake to measure it in terms of the quantity of goods. What is given up in a purchase is money or credit. What we go through is we go through a cycle. We go through a credit cycle. Credit can be created. It's not created through the velocity as is commonly believed. Um, it, it can be cre created out of thin air. If I go into a store uh, or I have somebody paint my house and I say I'm going to pay you later, uh, I've created credit. That'll count in GDP. It'll be an item of production. So what we have is a credit cycle. If there's not much debt, if you don't have much debt, then you have the ability to borrow money. Let's say you earn $100,000 a year and you don't have any debt, you can then borrow $10,000 a year. You therefore can spend $110,000. Your spending of $110,000 is somebody else's income of $110,000. So it has a positive effect and you go through a cycle. And through that cycle, you spend $110,000, they earn $110,000, um, and we and the cycle becomes re self-reinforcing. Through that cycle, debt rises faster than income. Debt rises faster than income. Debt can't rise faster than income forever. So as debt rises faster than income, you have a, a debt cycle. Um, as you get, as it's, what causes it to stop? Well, traditionally, as you lower interest rates, um, it creates debt has three positive effects. If interest rates are too high, then you lower interest rates. Lowering interest rates has the effect of making it easier to service the debt. It has the effect of um, making items cheaper to buy on credit because the monthly payments are less. It has the a present value effect on assets. So if you lower interest rates and you have something that has a cash flow, let's say a piece of real estate or something, they have a present value effect. It causes those assets to go up. That produces wealth and that allows more borrowing. And so when you get to a situation where you can't lower interest rates anymore, let's say you hit zero, you hit that part of the cycle ends. So then you go to a deleveraging. Now a deleveraging, deleveraging means that you can't raise debt relative to income anymore. When you can't raise debt relative to income anymore, the cycle begins to work in reverse. So um, I think the people, if they, don't do a very good job of calculating incrementally what the effects are on demand. But let's say you're having debt growth um, at something like 10% and you go to a 5% debt growth instead, that has a negative effect on growth. It's the marginal change from that level produces a negative effect on growth. So traditionally in deleveragings, that negative effect that happens on for Let's say Europe is a very classic case. The, the Spanish banking system is a very classic case. The European banking system. As the banks leverage up at a certain rate, and they can't leverage up more than that rate, and they lessen the rate at which they're leveraging it up, it has the effect of beginning a, 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 a debt a deleveraging. Deleveraging means then the income, the spending, all produce a, sort of a negative cycle. That produces the beginning of a depression. A depression is the phase of a deleveraging in which there's um, a combination of austerity and uh, debt restructuring. Because if you have, it's a basic thing, if you have too much debt to service, you've got to do something about it. And when you have too much debt to service um, and you do something about it, there are a limited number of things that you can do. You can either transfer the debt, but you can transfer resources from the rich to the poor, so you can have it transferred, for example, from Germany to Spain. That's one way of dealing with it. The other way is to, you, you have a, a combination of austerity and uh, debt restructurings, 
A debt restructuring means that you lower the debt in one fashion or another. You lower the, the debt burden to something that you can afford to service because of the income that you produce. Um, restructurings can take one of three ways. You can either actually write down the debt. You write down the debt, let's say write it down in half, because you could service half, if you service half. But the problem is one man's debts are another man's assets. So when you write it down in half, you have a big negative wealth effect. So you have a negative wealth effect, you can't borrow money, it has that problem. So a restructuring um, becomes a problem. You could restructure it either in the form of writing it down, or in one way or another, you can lengthen the payments or you can uh, lower, forcibly lower the interest rate. But some way or another, you've got to get the payments in line for what the cash flows are producing so that you can service that kind of a debt. That's a very painful process. So a depression is the phase of the deleveraging when there's a, a combination of austerity and writing down debts. So classic the depression, 1930 to 1932, March of 1933, we print money. So all, the third way that you can deal with it is you can print money, the, essentially what we call print money. The, the printing of money means uh, that essentially a central bank, debt is a, a commitment to deliver money. So if a central bank slips into the system a certain amount of money each year, um, it can make that easier. Think about the debt write down, that something maybe uh, is a debt, and you say, I'm gonna write it down to a level that could be sustainable, and you write it down by 50%. That has a big negative wealth effect, big deal, bad. If in that, that if it's 10 year debt, maybe that's equivalent to 5% a year for 10 years. If you slip in 5% a year instead and to that person who then can pay that debt, they can service the debt, it's 5% a year, it's not that big a deal. And so in, in, in all deleveragings, in the end they print money. It's part of the mix. Now the best deleveragings are ones in which you um, have a balance of those things. Uh, ultimately you have to bring down the debt to income ratio. So, and uh, the ways that uh, ultimately you'll have a balance of those three things. Those three things, again, you're gonna have a certain amount of transfer of wealth, you're gonna have a certain amount, <clears throat> let's call them four things, a certain amount of austerity, a certain amount <clears throat> of debt rights downs, and a certain amount of printing of money. <clears throat> the, the debt write downs and the austerity are deflationary. The printing of money is inflationary. If you can get the balance right, of those things, then you have um, what I call a beautiful deleveraging. A, a deleveraging, well, you when you look at the deleveraging, <clears throat> the debt to income ratios, thank you, I'm fine.